Hey you guys, welcome back to the channel. This is Nathan Daly. I'm your law enforcement translator here to give you guys insight. So with that being said, special video today, special video. Shout out to my subscribers. Thank you for my new subscribers. Welcome to the channel. Please check out the holiday contest, you guys. In this video, I'm doing something a little different. This is simply a quick review of the panel discussion that I had on TLA's channel, the lead attorney. For those who aren't familiar, I'll leave a link of the lead attorney in the description box as well. The full video on his channel, I'll also link that as well. This is going to be the end segment of that four hour episode. It was crazy. You know, Nathan, I'm gonna bring Nathan up in a second. You know, Nathan will find it. If Nathan wants to damn pull you over and search your car, he's gonna find a reason to pull you over. Maybe you were going three miles over the speed limit. Maybe your tent might be a little bit too dark. I need to check. Maybe you touched the white line a little bit. It's a failure to, to, to keep your lane. All that other bullshit Nathan be doing. <laughs> Shout out to Nathan. I'm going to bring him up in a second. Nathan's a good one. We got some bad ones. Nathan's a good one. That's why I'm so glad that he's here. I'm going to bring him up. Let me do this. Let me let me bring up my my co-host, my uh, the man of the hour. Because again, I would not do this by myself. I need some. I need some help. Well, let me bring some help right here. Let me introduce the one and only Nathan Daly to the stream. <laughs> Nathan, how are you doing? Man, I'm doing well. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you so much. No problem. Yeah, Listen. It. Your voice is uh, so necessary, so necessary uh, in this in this conversation. You know, I'm on my old, I'm on my O'Shea Duke Jackson over here trying to <laughs> trying to help the new ones come in. And I remember when we first met, you had signed up for one of my consultations, and uh, I, you, you know, I not, not to put your business out of the street, but I was so excited talking to you because of the angle that you were going to come from. Right. And we have we don't have anybody in the space that is talking about. Uh, police officers, black police officers, and how how you guys work in the black community, and for to have someone like you with your experience and the things that you've been through in the manosphere and in this sector, oh man, it's such a great addition, you know, to have you know a, a you to have a JT a pocket watch and to have an Orlando miner with the damn uh, real estate. To have even even the young ones, even before the billions, you know, the data data analysis, all this stuff. This 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 sector is growing so strong. It so is strong. So I'm so glad that uh that that you that you're up here. Just give us a quick a quick a little thirty second uh synopsis of right what now. you're doing over there. All right, yeah. So again, TLA, thank you again for having me. Truly a truly a blessing. I really appreciate it. Uh, so shout outs to you and, and the advice that you gave me. I, I did take the uh, the counsel and it was uh, it was it was a one. It was it was very, very, very helpful. Uh, so a little backstory with me. I'm a third. And then not to just cut you off, but it's yeah. like you've been on YouTube for two months, right? Something like that. You already got like two thousand subscribers. Yeah. I was like, damn, <laughs> how do you get two thousand subscribers in two months? It took me a thousand. I did. O'Shea had to help me out. It was taking me a year. Yeah, so that's out. how people are checking for you so hard, man. Two thousand subscribers in two man. months. Man, I'm grateful. I'm, it's truly a blessing to be honest with you. Um, and shout out to O'Shea as well. He, he's 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 great, man. Phenomenal guy as well. He's definitely very helpful. Yeah. Um, so so I would say my my backstory: 13 years in uh, law enforcement. I started in uh, 2007, and so I started in DeKalb County, <laughs> as you know from Decatur. You know, so yeah, uh, started in DeKalb County. So a lot of my training, a lot of my knowledge rooted in that. I worked predominantly black community. And from there, I went to uh, Georgia Gwinnett College. I, I was there for about four years. And then after that, I left and went to Dunwoody, which is where I ended up um, when I was actually injured. I know you spoke a little bit about that. I was drugged down the interstate of 285, those who are familiar with, uh, with Georgia, and uh, suffered some severe injuries. I had multiple surgeries and ultimately ended up having to retire because of the, uh, the injuries. I can't physically do the job anymore. Um, but... You know, honestly, God is good. You know, he held on to me in that moment and I found a new purpose. And I found a, a purpose here on YouTube to really share and kind of give insight 
on law enforcement. Because mind you, this incident, when I got injured in 2019, mm. in August, and then leading up to that, we had COVID. So I was out the entire year doing surgeries. Uh, when COVID hit, then we had the, the protests, we had the riots. And, you know, I'm sitting back trying to heal, kind of witnessing all this. I said, man, we need to we need to definitely say something. There's so much that needs to be talked about uh, in regards to law enforcement. And there's a lot of change, some real reform. We can talk about real reform and real issues. And I said, you know, I want to champion this cause. I want to help uh, law enforcement to, to translate properly to the communities, especially our community, the black community. We don't have any good representation uh, at the moment, not that I've seen. And I want to I want to re repair that bond. Right. It's broken. You know, yes. the, the trust is broken uh, and rightfully so. There's a there's a lot of things that go on. Um, some things have been exaggerated. And so I want to bring clarity, I want to bring truth back into the conversation so we can rebuild this relationship and have better outcomes with law enforcement because the conversation needs to be had. You know, awesome. So this is something I want to share with you guys. It's a panel discussion. We have a few people on the panel who asked some very, very interesting questions. A lady asked about training. I was able to answer her questions there. I'm really curious to see what you guys think about this discussion. Miss B Finesse, let me try to unmute you. It says that I cannot unmute you because you have, uh, you have muted yourself. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you now. Okay, How are sorry. you doing? <laughs> Look, trying to cook, dang it. Okay. Man, you are struggle streaming just like me. <laughs> um, I have a quick question. Cause I know um, as far as me being an educator and in education, we have to do um, uh, so much training, training on all kinds of things. Even when you were talking about earlier de-escalation, we have to even do training about how to de-escalate when we see students getting ready to fight or um, in, in a motive or have a mindset that they're, you know, ready to, to um, do something to each other. So my question to you, Nathan, do you believe um, the training will actually help those officers for for the bigger picture? Or do you really think it's, it's more of a mindset thing? Do you think if they do mandatory training and they make officers get this training, do you think the officers will take heed from your perspective on the inside looking out? Um, that's an excellent question. Um, I say it's a, multi it's a multitude of things. One, mm. the training is only as good as the person that's accepting the training. Facts. Um, and so if your mindset is not there and you're not willing to receive it, right? If you're not willing to be introspective as an individual, as an officer and say, listen, I'm weak in these areas, right? I'm, I lack mm -hmm. this cultural understanding of these people that I'm enforcing laws on, right? Mm -hmm. I don't really know anything about the Hispanic community or the black community, right? And this is, mm -hmm. and I'm, and let's say I'm, I'm white and I have to go in here, but it's an intentional effort that an officer has to make to want to serve the community in the way that they would serve their own community, right? And mm -hmm. so it's being able to get into that mindset. It's a conscious effort. The training has nothing to do with, you need the training, but this is mm -hmm. more on the individual personal because I know plenty of white officers and they have the heart of gold, you know what I mean? Right. And they want to make, they want to make a good relationship. They want to have a good impact. So the issue is you have to want that, you know? And I tell people all the time, all police officers are not created equal. Right. So you can have you can have 10 of us lined up and we'll all enforce the law or look at the law different through our lens, mm -hmm. through our, our morals, through our values and sometimes through our religious beliefs. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And so we have to look at all those factors. Um, training does help, but it falls heavily on the individual to one, acknowledge and then also to to make an instinctive, honest, genuine effort to 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 see that that training. Um, shows itself in, in the work and the behavior of the officer. Absolutely. Mm. Awesome. Let me Thank just get that. this. Um, well, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, two things, Lee. Um, one, well, let me let me touch on something that uh, Brother Nathan had just mentioned. You know, it's interesting, the story that he just said about the black cop coming out, showing uh, using a show of force to a person, um, potentially violating their rights or whatnot, is looked at differently than a white cop. The first thing that popped in my mind was the movie uh, Boys in the Hood. As mm. soon as he was telling that story, this, the, the scene in Boys in the Hood where uh, uh, where the actor Jesse uh, Lawrence Ferguson, may he rest in peace because he passed away. Uh, he played that officer Kofi and he hit and he yeah. put that gun in his mouth. Oh, and was like, yeah. Right. Yeah. Remember how he did it? And yep. so that's the as soon as you was telling that story, uh, uh, Officer Nathan, that that that's that that popped in my head it was like, damn, 
black cops. But then you said oftentimes that people look at a white cop that does the same thing and said white cop is racist. But right. see, what I think a lot of people are saying is black or white, you could be racist. Mm, Especially okay. if you use black or white, you can be racist. At least now I'm out here in Los Angeles. I'm in L.A. OK, so there we go. A lot of yeah, times, yeah. black cops, black cop, black dirty cops, and white dirty cops are not. They're, they're not, you know, mutually correct. Uh, I know what you mean. From each other. So a lot of people right. look at them and say, "You, you black, but you racist too." You know, right. so they they clump, they clump it all. They clump it all in one. Yeah, correct, correct. So I just wanted correct. to throw that thought out there that sometimes, you know, people would be like, "Yeah, white people is being racist and black people is just being assholes." But sometimes, right. if you're smart enough, you can say, you know, racism. <clears throat> It you know transcends the person's color has everything to do with what the the power that they're wielding and and and, and basically the abusing. abuse of it. Yeah. I absolutely yeah. agree. And yeah, then, and how do you feel about that? Oh, let me just, let me just uh, kind of oh, ask Nathan how he feels about what you were saying, Shannon, because Nathan, you worked in a in a in a place that was, I mean, super majority us, right? Yeah. Did you see any of that where? You know, it was just so many black folks here in DeKalb County that where you were at. Did you see anywhere? Any any officers where you thought they just, you know, they I don't know whether it was just an embittered thing or, you know, they just felt like black men were this way or that way. Or did you see any of that? Or what do you think about that? Yeah. So, you know, I've I've been in positions where I've I've checked officers and actually have to correct the officers, you know, black officers. And the mm. thing is, and, and I'm not the only black officer who has done it. We do it. You know, you guys don't see it. You don't hear about it. You don't see the things that happen behind the scenes. And we can't even, honestly, we can't talk about it. You know, we it, this is a type of profession where, you know, we can't just openly share these things, right? Because our job will say, well, if you if you want to speak about these things, you'll, you'll lose your job. Mm. You know what I mean? So there's a, there is a, people talk about the blue curtain, that type of thing. But the reality is um, we are not privileged to really share certain things without risk losing your, your job or causing a lot of problems. And it's not to say you don't report bad things that happen or officers doing bad things because you can report those. But what people also have to realize that officers also hang out with like-minded officers. So I, I spent a lot of time with officers who were very good quality officers. Mm. And you know, right, you're working with, the, with thousands of people. So you know the ones you're like, ah, I don't like the way he does his job, right? He's shady. I don't like the way he puts these charges together. I'm not feeling that. But sometimes you have to back these officers, right? You show up on a scene and they're doing something. I had a guy one time, he was trying to write this woman seven citations you know, for, for, for a vehicle, her vehicle. And, you know, she had, she was, he was getting ready to impound her car and kick her, her and the kids out the car. You know, she had, she didn't have insurance or anything like that. It was, it was a lot. And I said, so you're going to charge her over, you know, $3,000 worth of citations. You wow. know, if you're struggling, just lost her job. This is a brother looking at a, a black woman with, with kids. And so you have to ask yourself, where's his mentality, right? So there is a, there is a line that officers have to be able to use discretion but you see a lot of that abuse and that overcharging, excessive nature or whatever when it comes to us on our own people, right? And so to what, to what the brother was saying there, he's absolutely correct, you know? And so, yeah, I've, I've seen it. I've checked officers and correct officers, white and black, all, all, all skin colors. Interesting. Let me give a big shout out to Rise Up. Thank you so much. Says, is this man really on a bike as United brothers. Fitness? That's why I need Says, to be. Wow, the politics and politics, politics man. Yes, <laughs> yes, the, yes, the, yes. The behind the scene politics and, and politics. Man, you have no idea. Mm -hmm. You have no idea how bad it is, and and how easy it is for one person can actually set off the set set the entire thing um, ablaze. You know, if you have one person in the system that we operate in um, to not be to be uh, biased, right? That's exactly right. It doesn't take much, man. It doesn't take much. And, you know, this, the TLA, this goes into what, you know, I wanted to talk with you about, too, as well, is just the, the power of us as a community putting ourselves in a position of power to have influence, mm -hmm. right? Because if we're not there, we can't affect change. You can't create change if we're not present. And so, you know, people, we, we complain about not having enough Black attorneys, not having enough Black judges or, you know, politicians or... Hell, even police officers, there's not enough of us in this space. We don't want to do this profession, right? Um, but but when you think about it, I get to work within this space. I get to to, to speak on behalf of other um, Black men and women. So if I see things that are wrong, if I see things that looks a little suspicious or things that make me uncomfortable, I can speak on our behalf, right? That's the beauty of having us 
in these spaces. We need more of us um, in all uh, segments of the criminal justice system from, from top to bottom to bottom to top um, in order to have a voice, right? And I think I was doing some research a, a long time ago in reference to attorneys. You guys don't realize, uh, I mean, T TLA knows, but for the, for, for the audience here, um, according to the American Bar Association, Black African-Americans only make up 5% of the attorneys in this country. Mm. 5%, you guys. 5%. I think they're all in DeKalb County. <laughs> they're, all in DeKalb. <laughs> they're all in the South. Right. You know, so, so what does that mean? You know, we have more criminal defendants coming through the courtrooms than we have attorneys wow. that are black. You know, so we, we have to we have to pay attention to that. You know, we have issues with law enforcement. I get it. And these are legitimate issues. We need reform. We need criminal justice reform. But if we're not present in these courtrooms, to make decisions. If we're not sitting on those, we're talking about the jury. Now we're talking about the judge, how the judge can be biased. Mm -hmm. How many black judges have you ever seen on TV? You exactly. know, equalize. Let's equalize the playing field. We got to, man. We got exactly to. Exactly right. Ju Julius right. Jones. I don't know what happened. Do you know what happened with the Julius Jones case? I, I don't know about this. Yeah, I'm actually working on some content now for it. I'm mm -hmm. doing research on it. But basically what it, what it's looking like is he was wrongfully accused of a crime. Um, and so, you know, he's, I think he was on death row and they just got him off of death row, but yes. he's, still, he's still in prison. And, you know, this, this is, this is an issue with our, our, our criminal justice system. Again, you know, we have a lot of, we've asked, we have a lot of, there's a group called, um, ah, damn, it's escaping me. Um, the innocence project. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if you're familiar, if you heard about it, but the Innocence Project, if you get a chance to do a little research on them, they yeah, are they're huge. People, they are a group of people who actually go and investigate these allegations of people saying, hey, I was wrongfully accused. You know, I'm innocent. I never committed this crime and I'm, I'm doing life. I'm doing 30, 40. And I like reading through those. I like going through them because it reinforces why I need to be good at my job, why I need to be sure that when I'm pressing, I'm, I'm putting charges on someone that I know exactly what I'm doing, the evidence is there. You know, but it, it does. It speaks to a bigger issue in our criminal justice system where it's it's not difficult for someone to be implanted somewhere in the system and can really interfere with a person's freedom, um, whether they're doing it through their ego or their or personal vendetta or whatever, a person who was just abusing their power. And we see that in these cases and cases like Julius Jones as well. So, you know, there's a lot of work that needs to be done, you know, that 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 we can work on to kind of expose some of these um these these unfortunate circumstances and it's sad man he's so I, I think this is really interesting when we look at the Ahmaud Arbery case right and his situation where you have someone who can create these false narratives on on this gentleman right mm -hmm. and then it's not until this video surfaces and even the video itself wasn't strong enough to to really get get the ball rolling what was it it was the the black community it was other people who had bigger platforms same thing we see with Breonna Taylor galvanizing around this issue and bringing light to it. See, yes. we have the power, we have the ability, we have the means to do it, right? Collectively, when we really focus on an issue, we can start to affect a lot of positive change, right? And so when you think about it, th that video didn't exist. If you think about a lot of people weren't really galvanizing around Ahmaud Arbery's cause, Breonna Taylor, these are people, we, we have come together as a community and brought light and a magnifying glass to these issues. And so now it comes down to, hey, we have the ability to do it. Now we need we need to start coming up with the solutions in order to really, really fix the problem. You know what I mean? And so um, that's the beauty of it that I think, you know, we definitely have the ability to do. Anyways, let me know what you think. What are your thoughts on the conversation? And with that, you guys, allow these truths to find you when the lie has left you. And with that, good night. God bless.